Welcome to the Clinical Podcast Series brought to you by the American Academy of Optometry Foundation and the Clinical Binocular Vision and Pediatrics Care Channel. Today's episode is Virgins and Accommodation Deficits in Children and Adolescents with Vestibular Disorders. I'd like to thank our host, April Jasper, topical editor, Maureen Plowman, and topical expert, Marielle Reedy. Now on to the show. Hi, everyone. I'm April Jasper, and I'm speaking today with Marielle Reedy. Marielle received her OD and MS degrees from the Ohio State University College of Optometry, followed by residency training in pediatric optometry and vision therapy at Southern California College of Optometry. She then returned to Ohio State, where she is now a clinical instructor and PhD candidate. Marielle is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and serves on the AAO Nominating Committee. Today, she will be discussing the January 2023 ophthalmic and physiological optics paper entitled Virgence Accommodative Therapy for Symptomatic Convergence Insufficiency in Children, Time Course of Improvements in Convergence Function by Genoin et al. Wow, that's a lot, Marielle. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Thank you so much for being here. I know all of us are excited to be able to have you kind of break down this research and make it so it's relevant to us. Of course, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's start with the first question. I understand this is a secondary outcome paper from the CITT art study. What was of particular interest to the authors for this paper? Yeah, so um, this secondary outcome paper was really looking more comprehensively at the timeline for improvement and convergence measures for these kids with symptomatic CI. Um, specifically, they're looking at NPC and positive fusional virgence ranges or base out virgence ranges at near. And they were analyzing um, the kids who had um, been in the CITT art study for the 16 weeks of therapy. Um, and they looked at differences within that group of kids at different timelines. Um, they also looked at how the additional four weeks of therapy in CITTR might have impacted therapy outcomes compared to the 12 weeks done in the original CITT study. So tell us a little bit more about the analysis. How did they break up the therapy timeline? Yeah, so um, just kind of built into the uh, the protocol is they had progress checks every four weeks where they did a lot of um, follow-up measures, but specifically they also looked at NPC and base out ranges. And so the authors had these data to look at improvements in these four week time intervals. And at each time interval, they looked at the mean value for each clinical test, as well as the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile in order to see if there was any difference between those who were kind of starting out at a greater deficit. So for reference, for NPC, the baseline 75th percentile was 17.3 centimeters, and the baseline um, base out ranges at near was 8.7 prism diopters, just to kind of give a sense of where some of these kids were kind of starting from. It sounds like a, quite a few of them had a way to go for improvement. So what did the authors find out about that timeline for improvement? Did it matter where the kids were starting from? Yeah, so first what they found out is that um, about two thirds of kids uh, reach normal performance by week four um, in for both NPC or base out range. So one or the other, they were able to get uh, to normal performance, but only 50% of the kids had normal for both of those measures um, by that four weeks. So we had really significant improvements in those first four weeks, um, but definitely still some improvement to go. But as far as where they were starting from, um, once those baseline measures were adjusted for, um, there was actually really similar performance by week four, regardless of the starting point, meaning that those kids that started off in a worse position improved more than the kids um, who were starting out with less of a deficit, um, meaning that, that by week four, everyone's kind of performing at a pretty similar, um, similar, oh gosh, level. Level, yeah, level, similar level by week four. Um, and while there was really significant improvement in just four weeks, there were still differences seen um, in right. each of those subsequent four week intervals um, throughout the rest of the 12 week, uh, 16 week vision therapy program. Um, and by the end of the, the 16 week program, 
98% of kids had a normal NPC, 94% of kids had normal uh, base out ranges at near, and 92% of them had normal for both measures. And bringing it back to the original study, um, the authors also note that the additional four weeks of therapy allowed time for two thirds of kids that didn't have a normal NPC to reach that mark. Wow. And about 25% of kids without normal base out ranges to reach that mark. Um, so that additional four weeks of therapy definitely helped out some of these kids. So then where and how, I guess, how is a better way to say it? How can clinicians use this insight or the insights that you've shared with us from this paper to really help our patients with convergence insufficiency? Absolutely. Um, something that's really insightful about this is that marked improvement in the first four weeks of therapy. So it's a really good time to have a progress check with these kids to look at it performance. And if there isn't an improvement, then we should be thinking about why do we need to reevaluate that original diagnosis? Or do we need to talk to families maybe about adherence to their home therapy program um, to really kind of nail down why we're not seeing that improvement? Wow, and that's great. Anything yeah. there, Marielle? Um, the, while great improvement is expected early on, only half the kids had normal findings for both tests at that four-week mark, while 92% of them achieved that in the 16 weeks. So that's really helpful for us in terms of setting timeline expectations with parents, too. Um, and I think another thing to note is that the authors um, do mention, you know, this paper focuses on objective outcomes and not on symptoms. So while these um, are really good measures to help us guide some of our timeline expectations. We definitely want to remember to assess the symptoms in our patients before we um, think about discontinuing treatment. This has been great. Thank you. You did just what I was hoping for, breaking it down to where we can then take it back to our practice and work with our patients with CI. Thank you, Marielle. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me.